Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to group six of our uh, policy and technology forum and expo today. Uh, this session is on low carbon transportation fuels. And again, my name is Carol Werner, and I'm the executive director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And we are so glad to be holding this event to have all of these terrific exhibitors and speakers participating today as we work together to try and find solutions uh, to solve energy and environmental issues as we work closely with the bipartisan uh, uh, House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. So in this session, as I said, we're really going to be looking at low carbon transportation fuels. And I cannot stress enough how important I think this whole area is. So much of the time when we hear about energy and energy policy, so much of it is focused on, is focused on the power sector, on electricity, which is terribly, terribly important to be sure. But at this stage, one of the other things that has happened is that we now have more greenhouse gas emissions coming from our transport sector than from the power sector. In fact, um, the transport sector is now producing the largest amount of any sector. So it's really, really important that we address this. And while some people think when they think about transportation and changes, they think only of electric vehicles and, and primarily cars. And what's really important to understand is that, is that the sector is much larger than that, uh, will continue to be much larger than that in terms of looking at fuels, which is why it's so important to have these folks with us today to talk about this. So to start us off is Burl Hagwood, who is a board member for the Clean Fuels Development Coalition and the Clean Fuels Foundation. 19 years ago, Congress gave EPA the authority to take the toxics out of gasoline. Yet there are still about 30 billion gallons of benzene-based fuel in our gasoline. Congress needs to ask EPA why. Because 71 years ago, the American Petroleum Institute said the safe threshold for benzene was zero. And we can all do the math on zero. Congress needs to ask why. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology estimates that 50,000 people die maturely, prematurely each year from pollution from transportation fuel. And that's not all diesel gate, it's gasoline gate. That death rate is on par with the opioid epidemic, but it's not in the news. Congress needs to ask why. The latest data says air quality is getting worse. And as Carol said, greenhouse gases are more, coming more now from transportation fuel than anything else. It's, about, it's not about Dieselgate and the 500,000 cars that Volkswagen uh, created a software defeat device. This is about gasoline gate. And this is a report we sent to Congress today that was released on July 4th that explains that story. We want to know why EPA refuses to use real world fuels and real world testing, which is what Europe is doing after their experience with Dieselgate. The EPA has refused to update their transportation cost benefit analysis for 18 years. If it were my house, and this is also my house, I would want to know why. How can they not respond to Congress for 18 years? The Department of Agriculture, the Department of Energy have all revised their greenhouse models to show the positive contribution of biofuels and what they're making to reduce greenhouse gases. But not EPA. We think Congress should ask them why. EPA, by the power vested in them by Congress, is about to release its safer, affordable, fuel efficiency vehicles rule, ironically called SAFE. Will they choose a standard to lower toxics, lower greenhouse gases, lower fuel costs, lower vehicle production costs? 
Spoiler alert, we don't think so. Congress should ask them why. We suggest that EPA should be asked before their actions result in a decade, another decade of unnecessary higher fuel costs, sickness, disease, and unnecessary increases in health care costs. Ask them why. Then ask them why not. Why not a higher octane standard that will save money and save lives? If this were my house, and it's my house too, after I got done asking EPA why and why not, I'd want to take a vote. It would kind of go like this. Who wants more benzene in their gasoline? Say yay. Who wants more benzene in their air? Say yay. Who wants more benzene in their bloodstream or in their forming babies? Who wants to pay more for proven carcinogens in their gasoline? Who wants more greenhouse gases? Say yay. Who wants higher cost vehicles? Crickets. The nays have it. If people want a green economy, everybody wants a green economy, they're going to need a free market. And if you want a free gasoline market, we're going to have to free EPA from the stranglehold and influence of big oil. Hashtag gasoline gate. You can read the emails that show how EPA colluded with big oil to cook the books on emission tests that protect toxic aromatics and throw biofuels under the gasoline gate bus. Someone needs to ask EPA why. Especially in Washington, you never ask a question you don't know the answer to. We've prepared. Still not sure? And read this fact book. The real cost of gasoline is staggering. It's a thousand plus research studies that show the impact of gasoline emissions on the body and the unborn fetus and the cost that society pays dearly every day. It's hard to believe we now live in a time when consumers know what's in their water, what's in their food, and how many steps they take but they don't know jack about what's in their gasoline. Why? Don't like to read? Google, you don't know jack about what's in your gasoline. And jack will explain it to you. Spoiler alert, jack is no dummy. There was a time when the world was flat, smoking was cool, and people didn't wear seat belts. It's time for people to learn what's in their gasoline and why. Why do most people think they know a lot about what's wrong with biofuels, but they don't know jack about what's in their gasoline or the impact it has on their body or the fetus of an unborn child? It's time to free the gasoline market from the regulatory stranglehold of EPA. Congress can give consumers their inalienable rights to save vehicles running on safe gasoline so we can all breathe safe air. So you can be an advocate and sign the EPA gasoline, the EPA make gasoline safe petition at change.org. And that's our why and that's why we're here. So I'm gonna start a minute short and you know, my kids can attest I can talk about this forever. So everybody can sign up for the EPA petition because it's gonna take the consumers and Congress all working together to change the fuel standard to make safe gasoline. Thank you. Thanks, Bro. And obviously, it's really important for all of us to um, be good consumers, to be informed consumers. And um, because there are so many different aspects that we really need to be aware of with regard to health, environment, um, as well as, as energy components. So we're now going to turn to Alan Schaefer, who is Executive Director for the Diesel Technology Forum. Thanks very much, Carol. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Nice to be with you today. Um, a quick word about the Diesel Technology Forum. We represent manufacturers of diesel engines, trucks, equipment, uh, component suppliers, uh, companies in the renewable energy space like Neste, Renewable Energy Group, and the National Biodiesel Board, and uh, also a range of other emissions control technology uh, suppliers and the Western States Petroleum Association. So we have, a, uh, we have uh, members uh, sort of in all aspects of the diesel uh, industry. Um, and it's great to be here today. I would say that um, this, this event, the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency uh, Policy Forum and Expo, really suits diesel perfectly. Uh, because when you think about it, uh, we have one foot squarely in our uh, world of energy abundance uh, that many of you are, um, are thinking about today. But we also have one foot squarely in the future of clean energy. And diesel is a technology that delivers uh, on both accounts today uh, for our economy um, on a global basis. And I want to I want to start with a little a little quiz pop quiz for you today. So how many of you have an iPhone in the room? Oh, just a few people. I'm not I'm not here on behalf of Apple, but um, how long does your iPhone hold a charge on a lithium-ion battery? A day, a half a day, three quarters of a day if you're lucky. So. If your iPhone was powered by diesel fuel, it would last for 10 days. And I say that to make the point about energy density and energy efficiency. And uh, that's why diesel is the technology of choice for America's trucking industry, agriculture industry, construction industry, et cetera. So um, that's, uh, that's kind of our, our fun fact uh, for today. Um, I also want to just say a word about you know, sort of how diesel fits into the, uh, into the future. Um, and we hear a lot about battery and electric technologies, and those are, those are great, and some will be great for uh, future applications. And they get most of the headlines. I mean, let's be honest, right? Um, but I just thought it'd be interesting to share with you that um, uh, it's really, in California, we look at um, kind of how that state is doing relative to achieving its own uh, climate goals. And what we find is that uh, even though the battery electric technologies are getting most of the headlines, the reality is that it's diesel engines and biodiesel that are delivering the most carbon benefits today. So electric cars and trucks in California resulted only in about 1.2 million tons of CO2 reductions last year. That's one third of the emissions reduction delivered by diesel and biodiesel fuels. So as we look for solutions to reducing uh, CO2 emissions and achieving cleaner air, I think it's important to look broadly into technologies that are delivering today and, uh, and show great promise for efficiency um, tomorrow. Um, those of you who are here, uh, congressional staffers, thank you for uh, sharing a few minutes of your afternoon with us. Um, uh, 13 states here in the U.S. are home to heavy-duty diesel engine manufacturing that supports about $3.4 trillion in the U.S. economy and more than 1.25 million jobs across America. Uh, so the diesel industry is Im important to our, our economy here in the U.S. And the technology has come so far. I think, you know, some of you may remember um, uh, sort of the old days of uh, seeing a smoky diesel truck or bus somewhere. Um, we're proud to say in the diesel industry that those days are far behind us. And today's new generation of diesel is really near zero emissions for both nitrogen oxides and particulate matter. And in fact, it's so clean, and uh, here's your second fun fact of the day. Um, it would take 60, think about this for a second, it would take 60 of today's model commercial trucks, the big rigs, to equal the emissions of a single truck built in the late 80s. 60 to 1. That's how far we've come in making diesel clean. And manufacturers have really um, achieved not only a clean technology for their customers, but also one that's more fuel efficient as they work towards meeting EPA uh, greenhouse gas requirements um, in the future. So I, uh, I, I think that um, those are, are notable points about this technology. Um, I would also say that um, we're excited to be here today because when you pair the advanced generation of diesel technology with advanced high quality renewable biofuels, it's really an unbeatable combination that many cities and fleets around the country are finding that they don't have to change their infrastructure, they don't have to have big new investments, they don't have to dig up pavement, um, they can simply use their existing technology and switch the fuel to deliver lower carbon benefits. And for example, in California, the cities of Oakland, the cities of San Francisco, Walnut Creek, uh, Culver City, and on and on, uh, cities have switched their entire municipal service vehicles, their public fleets that serve your needs in those communities, 
and switch those towards using renewable biofuels. And so overnight, overnight, they reduced their carbon footprint by as much as 80%. That's a pretty impressive result. And the way they're doing that is burning those advanced renewable biofuels in existing diesel engines. So the solution is there. It's really delivering substantial results today. It's not something that we're promising for the future, but it's, uh, it's really working today. The last point I would make is that, you know, um, as folks here uh, debate these issues, uh, we often are attracted to uh, what might be, what might happen with electrification, uh, which states, which technologies, which vehicles are going to convert to electric, and surely some of that will happen and is happening today. But we can't take our eye off the ball for right now. We need to have continued steady progress in efficiency and clean air. And today's generation of diesel is delivering that time and time again. So with that, um, I say thank you very much. And thank you, Carol, for all your great work here in, at EESI and uh, for having us here today. Um, visit us. We're out here in the exhibit at the Expo. And you can also visit us online at uh, www.dieselforum.org. Thank you. So thank you, and I th because sometimes people may get confused when they hear diesel and don't realize, oh, diesel can be highly, highly efficient, and that there are renewable fuels in terms of biodiesel, renewable diesel that, that give you that renewable uh, performance in, in existing diesel engines. So we're now going to turn to Devin Mogler, who is the Vice President for Government Affairs uh, with Great Plains, Inc., and Great Plains is part of uh, Growth Energy. Thank you, Carol. Uh, as she mentioned, I'm representing Green Plains. We're an ethanol producer. We have 13 corn ethanol plants across the U.S. in eight states. I'm here on behalf of Growth Energy, which represents over 100 plants across the entire United States, as well as associate members that represent every step of the supply chain. So first of all, ethanol, it's just 200 proof booze. All our plants are are just di giant distilleries that take the starch portion of a corn kernel, that complex carbohydrate, and use yeast to break it down, those sugars, into alcohol. So you could drink it right out of the tube at the end, but we put denatrin in it so it only works in your vehicles. And most people don't even realize that they're burning it in their cars every day. So 10% of almost every gallon of gasoline sold in the US um, is, is our product, it's ethanol. So we produce uh, domestically about 16 and a half billion gallons every year. Um, unfortunately, we're not using it all here. We're, we're uh, exporting about 1.7 billion gallons of that overseas to other countries that are ramping up their ethanol usage. The, why aren't we using more here is basically because we're effectively capped. The petroleum industry still largely controls the distribution system, the pipelines, as well as the consumer facing, the retail infrastructure uh, at your gas station. And they know that our product is cleaner burning, they know that it's more cost effective, and that it works in almost every vehicle on the road. And so they're loath to give us more of the uh, slice of the market share. So we're right at 10% now. We've gotten a big breakthrough this past year. I will say the one good thing this EPA has done for us so far, this administration, is lifting the cap on on year-round sales of E15, which again is just, instead of 10% of ethanol in your, in your gas tank, is having the option, not the mandate, an option to choose 15% blend. That works in all uh, vehicles, 2001 model year and newer, which represents about 92% of vehicles on the road. And again, it's saving consumers um, just a little bit more than the, the E10 is. So the E10 on average saves you about six cents per gallon, adding E15 um, will save you about five to 10 cents. I just looked this morning, uh, unblended gasoline is trading at about $2 a gallon, whereas pure ethanol is a buck 50. So it's about a 50 cent spread there. So every additional gallon of, uh, or every additional percentage of ethanol that's going into your vehicle is saving you money. So it's like, a, it's like an extra tax break. And one of the things you know, we as a corn ethanol producer will get hit with is, oh wait a minute, aren't you, you know, taking food away from you know, what we could be eating? Well, first of all, the corn we're using to turn into ethanol is not the corn you roast on the 4th of July or get at the county fair. We're using field corn. The corn we eat as humans is only about 2% of what we grow here in the United States. The rest is what we call yellow, number two, dent, 
field corn. And so we take that, we take about 60% of it and turn it into ethanol. The rest of it gets turned into co-products, such as corn oil, which we sell to our friends in the biodiesel industry, uh, to turn into biodiesel. And then about 30% of that is called dry distiller's grains, which goes right back into the food supply, but food supply for animals, for livestock like uh, cattle and chickens, et cetera. So don't be, um, don't be fooled by the food for fuel argument. And then the other piece we get hit on a lot is, well, it isn't you know, corn actually you know, worse for the environment, corn-based ethanol. Uh, there's numerous studies out there, including the most recent one from USDA, showing that we're about a 43% uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, well to wheels, uh, versus a baseline gasoline. And again, that's for first generation ethanol. That's just for the corn. That's not taking into effect all the other steps uh, of the second generation ethanol, taking the corn stovers, the stalks, the, um, the leaves, et cetera, and turning them uh, into ethanol as well as a lot of the great things we're doing on the side now with bolt-on technology, carbon capture, et cetera. And we can get into all that more in the question and answer session. Um, and I'll uh, leave a little time here on the panel for the rest of my panelists. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. And hopefully we will have time um, so that we can uh, discuss a little bit more. Um, we're now going to turn to Cassidy Walter who is the Communications Director for the Iowa Renewable Fuels Association. And I have to say, I'm very proud because I also come from Iowa. Thank you. So being from Iowa, where, in case you didn't know, every year is an election year, <laughs> and one Iowa caucus season just sort of rolls right into the next one, I have to say that the 2020 election is on my mind, as well as likely many of you guys. And climate change and the role of carbon has already emerged as an important campaign issue for the candidates who are flooding my home state. There are a lot of exciting solutions out there, but here's the reality. On January 20th of 2021, if the newly elected or re-elected president were to hypothetically sign an executive order saying that every new vehicle sold is supposed to be an electric vehicle, by the end of that president's second term, the majority of the vehicles on the road would still require liquid fuel because it just takes that long to turn over our nation's fleet. And today, that's precisely the point I would like to make to you guys, that if you're talking low carbon, you should be talking about biofuels. If we as a country truly want to make, take immediate action to reduce emissions significantly over the course of the next two decades, biofuels need to be a part of that solution. To be clear, electrification will play an important role as well, but it would be a mistake to ignore our chance to decarbonize our liquid fuel supply. My name is Cassidy Walter, and I am the Communications Director for the Iowa Renewable Fuels Association. We are a state-level trade association representing Iowa's ethanol and biodiesel producers. Um, just a little bit of uh, information on you know, what is ethanol and what is biodiesel. Devin did a pretty good job. Um, ethanol is a biofuel that's made primarily from cornstarch. Um, it's used today in our gasoline vehicles, uh, typically in a 10% blend, but E15 is also growing. And biodiesel is, a, is an advanced biofuel made primarily from soybean oil, and that's blended into our diesel fuel supply. And common blends include B5, B11, and B20. And we're all here today to talk about clean energy. And this panel in particular, you know, we've been asked to talk about um, low carbon transportation fuels, which honestly is easy enough for me because working for an organization that represents ethanol and biodiesel producers, low carbon fuels is what I'm focusing on every day. Latest studies, as Devin mentioned, have shown that ethanol reduces greenhouse gas emissions by up to 43%. And as our industry becomes more efficient, that number is only going to grow. Biodiesel is America's leading advanced biofuel, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by up to 86%. Increased use in higher blends of biofuels is simply the fastest, most cost-effective resource the United States has to reduce uh, transportation emissions over the next decade. Every year, the biofuels industry is becoming more efficient and more environmentally friendly. We are using less electricity from natural gas and less water. 
Iowa is actually the number one producer of ethanol and biodiesel. And in our in my state of Iowa, increasingly our electricity and our, our power is coming from wind energy, clean, renewable wind energy. As a state, we're up to nearly 40% coming from wind. So that's just another way that our industry as a whole is becoming cleaner. Um, also, let's not forget Iowa's farmers who are harvesting more crops from the same amount of land and they're doing it today in a more sustainable, environmentally friendly way than ever before. So the fact of the matter is that biofuels are only getting cleaner while petroleum fuels are getting dirtier. And why is that? Well, first of all, it's who we are in Iowa. Iowa biofuel producers have a long history of looking for ways to become more efficient. And the more efficient they become, the more they're going to reduce their carbon footprint. And second, it's simple economics. California is our industry's biggest domestic market. And in California, how well a fuel does is tied directly to its carbon intensity score. Brazil is our biggest export market. And, in, and Brazil also judges fuels on carbon. As, do, um, as does the EU, and states in the northeast and northwest of our country are considering low carbon fuel standards, as well as can um, Canada, another important export market. So simply put, biofuels are ready and eager to play an important role in a low carbon economy because that is what our markets are demanding. Furthermore, reducing greenhouse gas emissions is not the only reason biofuels are good for our environment. We want to reduce carbon emissions, but we also need clean air. There's a growing body of evidence, which I think this gentleman here was referring to, that um, the particulate matter that is coming out of our tailpipes from the aromatics and transportation fuel um, to increase octane, the, these particulate matter are so small that our natural bodily filters can't filter them out. So then they go into our lungs and into our bloodstream and they cause DNA mutation and they lead to very serious health problems, including respiratory disease, heart disease, and even cancer. Ethanol and biodiesel burn cleaner than petroleum fuels and significantly reduce human exposure to these dangerous emissions. Ethanol is actually the world's cheapest, cleanest source of fuel octane. So if we as a country were to move toward higher blends, and I'm not talking about going from E10 to E15, even though we are very excited that we're moving, that E15 is growing, I'm talking about E30 and E50, 5.0. If we, if we could do that, we could reduce greenhouse gas emissions, sure. But we could also make a significant reduction in human exposure to toxic emissions in the air that we're breathing. So in conclusion, as policymakers out here in Washington are considering our nation's resources and the steps that we need to be taking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and protect our environment, we ask that they remember us in Iowa, the producers in Iowa, the bio, ethanol and biodiesel producers, who are creating clean fuels that we can use today to fight climate change and protect human health. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks so much. Um, spoken like a true Iowan, right? Thank you. Um, is it, we will now turn to uh, Kurt Kavark, who is the Vice President of Federal Affairs for the National Biodiesel Board. And he has been involved with biofuels and politics for many, many years. Thank you, Carol. I appreciate the kind introduction. I think we've got almost four Iowans on the panel. So we're well represented for... Uh, yeah, we've got, a, we've got to hold a caucus here this afternoon. Um, so I'm with the National Biodiesel Board, the Vice President of Federal Affairs. We handed out a, a, a packet like this, if you have it. Um, I'm just going to go through some of this. Uh, obviously, Cassidy and, and Devin, um, even Alan, covered a bit of my uh, presentation. So uh, we are the National Biodiesel Board. We're the National Trade Association that represents. Uh, we've got about 135 members across the country from feedstock providers to producers and marketers of biodiesel and renewable diesel. Uh, that includes about 95 production facilities. We have a production fi facility in every single uh, state in America. Uh, we serve the U.S. biodiesel industry as a primary domestic uh, voice for this emerging industry. Uh, our mission is to advance the interests of our members by creating sustainable biodiesel industry growth. Uh, among our organization, aside from myself and our government affairs shop, we also have a communications, uh, market development, and uh, technology and quality assurance programs to continue to promote 
the production, the use, um, and the marketing of the fuel. Um, the biodiesel and renewable diesel market, so just to give you a little bit of background, biodiesel is a fuel uh, made from fats and oils through ester esterification of fatty acids and vegetable oils and recycled fats. We do have our own ASTM standard, D6751. Renewable diesel is uh, another product that is made essentially from the same uh, feedstocks, uh, oils and fats, but it's made through a process much more similar to uh, petroleum refining. Um, and is a product that's essentially indistinguishable from a molecule of petroleum diesel. So while biodiesel, uh, today you will see blended anywhere from uh, B1 to B5 to B20, um, renewable diesel can be essentially uh, used 100% in, in today's um, technology of diesel on the road. So in many places you'll see if someone wants to do a fully uh, renewable diesel content, you can blend it at 20% biodiesel and 80% renewable diesel, and be, be essentially 100% renewable. We also have a product uh, called BioHeat that is blended in uh, uh, heating oil in the New England states, particularly. So you have primarily home heating oil uh, in, in New England. Uh, a lot of those folks are converting to blends of B5 to B20 to reduce carbon emissions coming from um, home heating fuel. Our current market today is about 2.6 billion gallons. So if you consider that on-road uh, diesel pool is about 40 billion gallons, uh, total distillate consumption in the United States is probably around 60 billion gallons. We're about 5% of the on-road uh, market. And about 70% of our product is essentially used by uh, a handful of the largest uh, uh, truck stop companies across the country. In terms of feedstock, we're extremely diverse. Uh, Ten years ago, we were probably uh, almost exclusively soybean oil. So as Devin was talking about the corn ethanol process, um, I'll talk a little bit about the soybean production process uh, in the Midwest. So uh, protein is essentially grown, or I'm sorry, soybeans are essentially grown for their protein. It's the highest uh, value, uh, most cost efficient way to produce protein to feed livestock. So 80% of a soybean is protein that's fed to animals. The other 20% is, is soybean oil. We have much more soybean oil in the United States produced as a byproduct of protein production than we can possibly consume in, in, our, 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 own, uh, in our own diets. So we have a surplus of soybean oil. The biodiesel industry essentially exists uh, to add value to that surplus oil. But as I mentioned, we're, we're significantly more diverse in terms of our uh, feedstock than we were a few years ago. Um, if, you, if you look at the charts on page four, you'll see soybean oil today is only about 50% of our feedstock. Our other feedstock comes from uh, used cooking oil, uh, distiller's corn oil, which, which is a byproduct of the ethanol process, um, and animal fats. So we have a lot of animal renderers who are now collecting used cooking oil across the country, as well as turning uh, uh, byproducts of the animal production process, the, the excess animal fats, into a renewable fuel. So we're essentially uh, recyclers of uh, oils and fats that don't have another market. Which gives us uh, a, a really great environmental profile in terms of GHG reduction. So um, others have mentioned uh, corn ethanol. We're, we're considered an advanced biofuel under the renewable fuel standard, which m means we must reduce carbon emissions compared to uh, petroleum diesel by at least 50%. We're actually, uh, recent studies show us anywhere from 76 to 86 percent. You might say, why is there a variance in, in, in that? Why isn't it just 86 percent? It all depends on what the feedstock is. So used cooking oil obviously has the, the greatest GHG reduction compared to petroleum, and it's, it's a range depending on what the feedstock is. But as a result, 86 percent lower carbon emissions, 45 percent lower particulate emissions, uh, less wastewater, uh, less hazardous waste, obviously, um, in the atmosphere, in the air. We add value to the farm economy, 63 cents per bushel. Right now, today, in terms of today's price of a bushel of soybeans, that's about 11% to the value of their crop in, in adding value to the uh, surplus soybean oil. Um, we also save live, livestock producers by making the feedstock for their, their or the, the protein for their animals cheaper. And then we uh, save consumers at least 17 cents on every gallon of diesel in 2017 by adding additional fuel into the supply. 
So that's a snapshot of our industry and our, and our GHG reduction. We've obviously, uh, we've got a handful of supportive federal policies that we work to maintain. The one thing that we, we encourage and ask Congress on a, a regular basis is for certainty and predictability in our federal policies. The first one is a biodiesel tax credit. Uh, there's been a $1 per gallon tax credit in place since 2005. It's what we call part of the tax extenders. It's available to the blender of the fuel, so it essentially, essentially incense the blending. It helps our downstream marketers want to become invested in the fuel, put it in the infrastructure, market it to the consumer, and then obviously pass some of the savings on to the consumer so they choose to buy the fuel. That tax credit has been on again, off again since 2005. It's been lapsed right now since uh, December 31st of 2017. There is a bill <clears throat> here in the House, uh, H.R. 2089, introduced by Representative Finkenauer and Mike Kelly from Pennsylvania. Uh, currently has 57 co-sponsors. It was included in the uh, tax extender markup uh, last month, a three-year extension for 18, 19, and 20. So we hope to see uh, quick action to get that tax incentive uh, reenacted. As a result of its lapse, you know, as, as businesses that uh, depend on the tax credit and recognize in the past it's always come back, uh, they build in that tax credit in, in the value of their product. And in order to sell the product, that, that tax credit is built in. And with the fact that it's now been lapsed for 18 months, we're starting to have facilities that are shuttering. Missouri, Texas, Nebraska, all facilities that uh, the economics just aren't there and they can't take the risk on the tax credit, so they're shutting down, which means less feedstock being purchased, less fuel being purchased, uh, increase in, in GHG emissions as a result of uh, fewer gallons of biodiesel. Uh, second federal policy is a renewable fuel standard created in 2005 and act, or expanded in 2007. We are in the advanced category, uh, so we go to EPA every year and ask for higher volumes. They always set the volumes lower than our current market, which is frustrating. The, the RFS was meant to drive demand and, and send market signals, yet EPA has consistently set our uh, volume below our own market. This year, uh, for 2020, we're at 2.43. The proposal that just came out from EPA last week uh, would maintain us at 2.43. And as I said, our market last year was 2.6, uh, more than 2.6 billion gallons. On top of that, EPA has been granting um, uh, every, essentially every small refinery exemption that's been um, uh, filed. Under the previous administration, you had somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 10 small refinery exemptions granted each year. This administration has been uh, handing them out like candy. And as a result, they've, they've, they've granted these exemptions after the renewable volume has been set. So while EPA says our RVO is 2.1 billion for this year, it's actually significantly less because they've exempted uh, a couple billion gallons of, of, of demand of, of petroleum product that would be required to be blended with biodiesel. So we're actually below that. And then finally, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our state efforts. Um, as others have mentioned, because of the GHG profile of our fuel, our highest demand, for, I mean, our, our product is produced around the country, uh, the highest demand is in California. In fact, as far as the LCFS is concerned, biodiesel has helped generate at least about 45% of the LCFS credits. All the fuel, that, a lot of the fuel that we produce essentially heads up to, uh, out to California to help them uh, comply with their uh, low carbon goals. Same thing is happening up in New York uh, and New England. They're all enacting a lot of state programs to uh, reduce carbon emissions, and biodiesel happens to be the here and now uh, fuel that is the, the answer that do, doesn't require conversions, any type of infrastructure uh, improvements, et cetera. I think I'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Kurt. And I once again, this is an area where um, there are lots of feedstocks that are available. And I'll never forget, several years ago, um, in terms of talking about biodiesel, for example, I was told, just remember fog, fats, oils, and greases. Um, in terms of thinking about all of the things that actually can be used. And once again, one of the things that I think is also really cool is are all of the components that can be problems that now can actually solve problems, be solutions, and produce a cleaner environment and give us energy. So we should always remember that, and that's actually very cool. Uh, so uh, 
we're going to take another look at another fuel uh, in terms of how we uh, look at a whole portfolio of, of cleaner fuels uh, in terms of thinking about air and, and lowering greenhouse emissions. So to talk a little bit about that is Allison Cunningham, who is the Director of Federal Government Affairs for the Natural Gas Vehicles uh, for America, which is also called NGVA. Thank you, Carol, for the introduction. And I'll apologize because I am dealing with the very end of a summer cold, so I'll do my best to get through my remarks without coughing or having a coughing fit. As Carol mentioned, my name is Allison Cunningham, and I am with NGV America. I'm our Director of Federal Government Affairs. For those of you unfamiliar with our organization, we are the national trade that works for increased use of natural gas in transportation. That includes CNG or compressed natural gas, LNG or liquefied natural gas, and increasing deployment of RNG or renewable natural gas. We have about 180 members across the country, everything from fleets, local distribution companies or gas utilities, clean cities groups, original equipment manufacturers and fuelers. There are companies that you have heard of, including UPS, Waste Management, Frito-Lay, PepsiCo, Loves Travel Stops, Trillium, Clean Energy Fuels, and many others. So I'll go ahead and provide an overview of natural gas and transportation, then I'll go more specifically into renewable natural gas. So why natural gas for transportation? Natural gas and transportation provides several advantages, including economic, environmental, and energy security benefits. Uh, important to our topic today, NGVs offer unmatched emission reductions benefits. This was alluded to earlier, but we ask ourselves, why does this matter? Well, according to the American Lung Association, over 140 million Americans live in areas with air that is unhealthy to breathe. So that's about four out of every 10 Americans. This disproportionately impacts certain communities, unfortunately, including urban areas. In fact, 71% of African Americans live in counties in violation of federal air pollution standards. And by far, the leading source of these urban emissions is from medium and heavy duty vehicles. This includes short haul trucks, long haul trucks, refuse trucks, school buses and transit buses. And that makes sense, right? These vehicles are on the road or idling all day. They're high fuel use vehicles. And there are things like delivery trucks, seeing increased deliveries from Amazon, kind of with the way internet purchasing is going. You might see trash trucks coming down your street. They spent a long time there. But that means that these trucks also present the biggest opportunity for clean transportation and the biggest area where we can make a difference. For example, if you replaced one traditional diesel with one of the new ultra low NOx NGV trucks, that's the emissions equivalent of taking 119 combustion engine cars off the road. That's because the cleanest commercially available heavy duty truck engine in the world right now is powered by natural gas. That's powered by the Cummins Westport ultra low NOx engine, which is certified 90% cleaner than EPA's current NOx standard and 90% cleaner than the latest available diesel engine. So don't beat me up, guys, sorry. NGVs are also part of our climate change solution. Fueling with natural gas reduces CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions. On a weld wheels basis, natural gas reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 17% for CNG and 11% for LNG. Uh, and if we're looking at carbon reductions, renewable natural gas provides an even greater carbon reduction. CARB, or the California Air Resources Board, has found that RNG, depending on the source of the fuel, can be anywhere from 40 to 125 percent lower than traditional fuels on a well-to-wheel -well basis. So CARB also certified RNG from dairy waste, which is the highest methane concentration, as negative 303 carbon intensity. If you look at CARB's LCFS pathways, that's far lower than any other fuel, including hydrogen and electric. So what is RNG? RNG is biogas or biomethane captured as organic waste breaks down above the Earth's surface. It's harvested directly from food waste, wastewater, which is done here by DC Water, agriculture waste or capturing landfill gas. Waste Management is a member company of ours. They're the nation's largest waste hauler. They capture gas from their landfills and utilize it in their trucks. And the, the growth of this technology is just occurring rapidly. In 2018, 30% of fuel used in on-road NGVs was renewable. So that's about 204 million gasoline gallon equivalents. Over the past five years, RNG use has displayed over 7 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. 
So if you put that in perspective, if you looked at those last five years, RNG as a transportation fuel has lowered greenhouse gas emissions equivalent to removing 1.5 million gasoline passenger cars from our roads for one year. It's reduced CO2 emissions equivalent to 815 million gallons of gasoline or 712 million gallons of diesel consumed. And that's equal to the total energy used by 868,000 U.S. homes for one year. And I have all these statistics at our table over in the other room. RNG has a lot of other benefits. It aids rural areas and creates revenues for farmers. You likely know that we have 34 natural gas producing states if you're talking about geologic natural gas. We like to say that with RNG there could be 50 natural gas producing states. RNG captures that naturally occurring methane, as I mentioned before, so it really provides a double benefit. For continuing to clean up our air through time, we're going to be needing to look to those other sources of naturally occurring methane and other emissions, so this captures those and it gives a double benefit. I also like to say that RNG offers the quickest path to a renewable future, which is a conversation we're having a lot now uh, in Congress and elsewhere. RNG uses proven technology. Once you get RNG into the natural gas system, it is completely interchangeable with geologic natural gas, so it uses vehicles and engines that are already on road, that are already tested and already deployed, and it uses existing natural gas distribution infrastructure as well. So what can Congress do in order to spur the growth of RNG and more deployment of RNG? The most important thing for our industry is extension of the Alternative Fuels Tax Credit, or the AFTC. Uh, AFTC is a 50 cent per gallon credit for natural gas, including RNG, CNG, or LNG, sold or used as a motor vehicle fuel. This also includes hydrogen and it also includes propane and other alternative fuels, um, along with the biodiesel credit mentioned earlier. It expired in December 31st of 2017 and was retroactively extended then. It is also included in um, the grassley widened extender bill that was introduced in the Senate, as well as the package that was recently considered by House Ways and Means. So extending the AFTC as soon as possible, providing fleets with certainty, providing others with certainty to make these cleaner investments is absolutely crucial. There are also many benefits to increasing natural gas deployment in vehicles and to extending the AFTC. Deployment of more natural gas vehicles grow the American economy, spur manufacturing and infrastructure investment, clean our air, as I mentioned before. It also reduces our dependency on foreign oil, and it contributes to America's energy and national security. Uh, a few years ago, it was ahead of comprehensive tax reform, we conducted a study on a five-year prospective extension of the alt fuels tax credit and the kind of impacts that would have, and we found that for a five-year prospective extension of the credit, over the course of 10 years, without further investment from the government, we would see $9.9 .9 billion in economic growth, a $1 billion in avoided public health costs, creation of 62,000 new middle-class jobs with an average salary of $52,000 a year, and $5.8 billion in additional private sector investment in infrastructure and equipment. Use of more RNG is also expected to grow our economy and create jobs. A recent study in California alone found that dedicated investment in deploying low NOx trucks powered by renewable natural gas could create up to 134,000 jobs and provide up to $14 billion in added economic value by 2030. They found that the average labor income per job created was over $68,000 a year which is more than double California's median salary for current workers and more than I made my almost my entire time on Capitol Hill. So love to see those good paying jobs. We should grow RNG far beyond California though. Right now with the LCFS and with RFS, that's where a lot of this fuel is going, but we would love to see a growing thriving market nationwide. The AFTC certainly helps with that. And there's very broad geographic support for an extension of the AFTC as well. There are supporters of this credit and of use in these alternative fuels in every state across the country and that includes the over 180 members of NGV America, 2,600 plus members of the National Propane Gas Association, 750 members of the American Public Gas Association, 40 members of the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association, as well as a group called Transportation Energy Partners that represents clean cities coalitions across the country with about 13,000 stakeholders nationwide. There are over 140 transit fleets running on alternative fuels such as natural gas. 5,500 natural gas school buses are operating in the U.S. Both, and these are all covered by the alternative fuels tax credit as well. That's something that's unique about this is non-taxable entities are able to take advantage of this credit. So this enables school districts and universities and municipalities and transit agencies to take cleaner investments, 
utilize alternative fuels and make it affordable. So anybody here in the room works for remember, we'd love support for the alt fuels tax credit and for the other extent or uh, tax extenders that are now expired. So we have a tremendous opportunity and NGVs have the chance to make a big difference in the heavy duty space. So with that, I'm glad to take questions or open up to questions. And uh, once again, I think in terms of points made by our last couple speakers, um, it's really important for us to remember how important policy is. And I thank you all for uh, drawing out what some examples of policies are that really make a difference in terms of supporting these cleaner uh, industries that can really help us solve a lot of problems. So we have a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, any questions? Okay, and just wait for the microphone. I guess this question is for the whole panel. Um, how do you see this current season being impacted by, uh, number one, tariffs? Um, perhaps domestic producers are looking for other avenues for their crops? And um, secondly, flooding and the weather that we've seen occurring in the Midwest. wants to start okay uh, in terms of uh, biodiesel production so we don't we don't export much product in fact um, we fight for a level playing field and, and tend to to keep out product from Argentina and Indonesia that's heavily subsidized um, and in terms of the crop production I, maybe the folks closer to Iowa can tell me but my sense is that uh, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of shifting in terms of soybean acreage um, as a result of flooding. So we're not, we're not expecting much disruption in our industry at all. The only thing I will add is that um, uh, tariffs on soybeans, particularly to China, has created a depressed market in the United States for soybeans. And we essentially help buttress to some extent by adding value to the soybean oil uh, to help the soybean farmer kind of weather this, uh, this tur trade turbulence. I can speak from an ethanol perspective really quickly. The trade wars has, have certainly impacted our, our business. As I mentioned in uh, my statements, we export about 1.7 billion gallons of ethanol a year. Uh, it, that was what it was last year. That was a high water mark. It will not be that high again this year. China has ramped up their tariffs on ethanol to 70 percent, effectively cutting us out of their market. They're one of the largest growing uh, international markets as they move to an E10 standard for ethanol as well. And also Brazil has implemented a, a 20 percent tariff rate quota on us. They are typically our number one or our number two export market. So the trade war is hurting us there. And then your second point about the, the crop conditions, they're certainly portions of the Corn Belt which were late in getting their crop into the ground, which will impact the yield, or didn't get it planted at all. So there will certainly be areas uh, where um, corn becomes too expensive uh, and ethanol plants will slow or shut down, is my conjecture, unless we have ideal growing conditions throughout the rest of this year. The, the one silver lining for that is that it means higher prices for the farmers who are able to get their crop planted. Oh, I turned it off. Okay. Um, I think that um, they actually covered it pretty well. Um, just uh, And I guess I would kind of say, uh, I think Devin covered the corn side really well. On the soybean side, I haven't heard as much. So I'm kind of in the same boat of, I have heard that corn prices are going up and, and that crops got in late. Uh, I did hear that Iowa, well, what, Iowa in particular wasn't quite as far behind as some other states in, in, term, in terms of getting crop in the ground and planting on time. Um, um, but, and I, I've heard some stuff about the corn, but I haven't heard anything yet about what's going to happen with soybean prices, if, if anything. Okay. Um, and I've heard from family who have talked a lot about how late things have been. And I know that in Indiana and Illinois in particular that they have been dealing with a lot of late planting. And so I don't know the percentage of of crops that were not able to get in at this point. I know that there clearly were some, um, but I think it's too early to tell yet. So, but you guys make me very nervous when you talk about high water marks and things like that. It's like with all this flooding going around, change your lexicon, right? Okay. Um, okay, other questions? 
Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, this is a question for Cassidy. Uh, Cassidy, could you, I guess, share with us uh, perhaps one, uh, two or three um, of the lessons learned about a success, successful state level uh, renewable fuels, I guess, uh, economy? Your opinion. Wow, okay. <laughs> Are you talking about a low carbon fuel standards or, okay. Okay. Well, so in Iowa, we don't have a, a low carbon fuel standard policy like they do in California and some other states, but we do have um, some other state policies in place to help um, inc incentivize the use of, of more biofuels. Um, a really big one in, in our state of Iowa is the Renewable Fuels Infrastructure Program, which is a cost share program that's been really successful um, at helping retailers add the infrastructure that they need to um, add higher blends of ethanol and biodiesel to their retail stations. Um, we also have some ta other tax incentives that have in incentivized retailers to want to um, sell those those products. Um, and I, I think on on the on ter in the terms of you know state policy, th those are um, some of the the big things that have helped us be successful in Iowa um, to ha to make the fuels available to our to our consumers. If that if that's if I'm understanding your question correctly. Thank you. Other questions. Um, one thing I did want to mention, too, was that I think it was in May, uh, EESI held a congressional briefing looking at uh, biogas. And once again, in terms of looking at all of the different kinds of sources that can be used, just as we've heard in other panels so, so many times in terms of thinking about things that are wastes that can really be resources that helps us create a lot of positive economic um, activity, but also create a lot of public health and environmental benefits all at the same time. Um, any other questions, comments from anybody else on the panel? Um, then I want to encourage all of you to go to the tables of these organizations if you haven't done so already. Um, make sure that you become a better informed consumer about what is in our gasoline and understand, start to better understand about air toxics and aromatics. Really, really an important topic. Learn about what happens with regard to biodiesel and how these technologies and, and diesel uh, all work together about biofuels overall in terms of thinking about the whole role of, of ethanol and what it could mean and about um, uh, renewable natural gas and how we can just improve the efficiency of all of our vehicles um, through many technologies that can all, many of which can be blended together. Um, it's not just one answer, but there, we're lucky that we have a portfolio of answers that can really make a difference. So uh, join me in thanking this wonderful panel. <laughs>